Okay, Acts chapter 16. If you guys have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 16 for today's sermon. For today's sermon, Acts chapter 16. We're going to read through it together. I'm going to highlight a couple of things that are just practically going on. And then we're going to continue to move forward in what I believe is um, a timely word that God has given for this congregation this morning. And so once again, we just left off Acts chapter 15, which was called uh, the Council of Jerusalem. The big topic there was circumcision and what it meant for does it bring us salvation or is it faith in Christ? And there's a big apostolic meeting and I'm blessed personally because of that meeting. And it makes my job as a pastor easier, if you would, going forward. Because the reality of that meeting or the byproduct of that meeting is salvation is by faith alone. Salvation is by faith alone. You are saved not by what you do. You are saved by who he is. Does that make sense? He is the Savior. Well, Nick, what about all the work stuff, right? Well, I think that we know this practically. Real love always has an outworking. Does that make sense? Real love always has an outworking. When I was trying to pursue my wife, I, uh, she liked Dairy Queen at the time. It was right across the street. And so not only did I believe that she wanted me to pursue her, but there was an outworking. And every once in a while, I'd buy her like this little Dairy Queen blizzard, and I would place it on her car. And what's, that's me in my weirdness and awkwardness attempting to say, I think you're nice, right? I think you're cute. I want to pursue you. You know what I mean? I was, that was like how I tried to do that. But I'm just saying that like that it, it's not about the blizzard though, right? It really is about the fact of just like, man, who she is as a person. And what we do for each other does matter. But this council was saying, you know, with Jesus, like what is the work here that is happening? And and they all agreed, man, salvation is by Christ alone, not by what we do. Real love does have an outworking, yes, but the attaining of salvation is to be saved, to be sealed, to be living with him, to receive an inheritance that's eternal, is only by the work of Christ. So it's not about what you do, it's about who he is. And now that happens there. Paul and Barnabas, at the end of chapter 15, they begin to split ways. Uh, Barnabas takes a guy named John Mark, and uh, Paul takes a young man named Silas, and they begin this second missionary journey. So let's get into Acts chapter 16, and then we'll talk about uh, vision and guidance from God this morning. Acts 16, then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there. So Paul and Silas came there, and his name was Timothy. Now this guy, Timothy, is the young guy that Paul finds who he ultimately writes the epistles, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy 2. Does that make sense? So this is the same Timothy. So he comes to this place of Derby. Uh, if you don't remember that, that was the place, and Lystra, excuse me. Lystra is the place that, that they tried to kill Paul by stoning him. So Paul comes back to this place later on to check on the work that, of the church that was there at Derby, And he finds a young man named Timothy. And he was the son of a Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek. So he was half Jewish. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted to have him go with him. And he, Paul, took him. And circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Nick, what is up with that? I thought Paul was anti-circumcision. No, Paul was anti-circumcision by faith. Now he finds this young disciple and he has a Jewish heritage. Keep in mind, in that day, practically, his heritage gave him access, as we will find out later... Timothy is one of the reasons why Paul the Apostle is arrested in Jerusalem and then brought into court and ultimately goes to die. Because the reality was they thought that Paul was bringing Gentiles into the temple, and he wasn't. They considered, what I'm trying to communicate is this, Timothy, 
by his heritage, had a deeper access to the Jewish people. Now he becomes a witness to the Jewish people. But in order for that to happen and to go to a place that Jews have claimed, he has to become circumcised. So Timothy willingly becomes circumcised and has a deeper access to the Jewish people to preach the gospel. I don't know if you guys remember this practically. I know this is a lot of information. But do you remember Paul's heart initially wasn't for the Gentiles? Who was it for? The Jews. Paul wanted to see his brothers saved, man. And he saw this young guy, Timothy, and everybody spoke well of him. And he knew that Timothy could have access right deeper to accomplish the gospel's work in the Jewish community. And he did this. So Timothy willingly chose to do this for the purpose of the gospel. The funny thing is there's another young man named Titus. Titus in the gospel, and excuse me, Titus has an epistle, the epistle of Titus. The funny thing about Titus is that Titus, it says, was not compelled to be circumcised. What are you saying, Nick? I'm guessing that Titus was second in line to be circumcised. I'm guessing Titus saw Timothy be circumcised, and then he was like, uh, I don't want anything to do with that, right? And Titus wasn't compelled or wasn't led by the Spirit to do that. Does that make sense? And so my guess is that Titus went second. Nonetheless, that's neither here nor there. But the reality is, is that Paul is building up these young men to bring them with him to preach the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And verse 4, and they went through the cities and they delivered to them the decrees to keep or the, the faith by salvation, uh, salvation by faith, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Real quick, when I was young, I used to think, man, why do we even need theological doctrine? I used to get so wearied about people debating theology because I would just sit there and be like, why don't we just love people and do what Jesus said, right? Well, doctrine, as I'm learning as I grow, right doctrine is a right foundation. Doctrine is the central core of the church. It's the foundation of the church. It's the framework of the church. Think of it as your skeletal system, right? It's literally the core of everything. If you take that out, I could still be alive, but I would look like a blob of just weird goo up here. Does that make sense? Doctrine is like the skeletal system. Listen, and when you have bad doctrine and your back is out in the church, the structure that's supposed to support the weight, it brings pain. Does that make sense? And so a lot of times as a pastor, I call myself or brand myself a spiritual chiropractor. Because all my job is primarily is seeing people that are in pain and going, oh, oh, no, no, you just need a little bit of, how do you feel now? I feel great. You know what I mean? I'm like, sweet, sweet, sweet. And you're bringing the right things in. And look at this. Real doctrine, listen to me, brings strength to your salvation. It says even right here, it says in verse 5 that the churches were strengthened in the faith. Why? Because Paul came and said, listen, we're setting this in. We talked about the apostolic setting in, the foundation. We're setting this into the church that your salvation is only by faith, man. And the church began to be strengthened by right doctrine so they could walk out this calling of God. And so so my heart and my prayer, my hope for this church is that we never get sick sick of learning about an eternal God. Verse 6, and when they had gone through Phygeria and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden, write that down, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Interesting. After they came to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, But the Spirit of God did not permit them to go that way. So passing there, they came down, verse 8, to Troas. And a vision vision appeared to Paul in the night and a Macedonian man. And he pled with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. 
We're going to finish out these last five verses and then we're going to get into our main teaching. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran straight course uh, and on the next day to Neapolis. And there we went to Philippi, which is the foremost city of the part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. Verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down there and we spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was the seller of purple. The city of Thyatira who worshiped God and the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by God. So the Holy Spirit here is resisting Paul and forbidding him to go to these places to preach the word. He sits down. He has a vision. His back is to the Aegean Sea. And the vision says, come over to Macedonia, which is northern Greek area, essentially, where Paul would go over. So they all agreed that the Lord was saying, we need to cross the sea and go to Macedonia. And he got there. And the person that he found was a woman named Lydia. She was the seller of purple. First and foremost, she's like this enigma in biblical times because normally women aren't the owners of a house and they're not owners of enterprise. But Lydia here is with a bunch of women, women, and she her whole job is she makes purple. And purple in that day was the most expensive color to make. You would use it by snails and you would extract it. And that's why purple today or historically was always the color of kings. Does that make sense? And so we have a woman in this church. She's a lover of purple, right? <laughs> she loves all things purple. And, and, and Lydia is the same in this way. And so she was there with these women. And the Lord opened her heart to hear what Paul said. And verse 15, she and her household were baptized. And she begged us, actually, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. I want to talk to you this morning about vision and guidance. Vision and guidance. Vision and guidance. Man, God calls us to have vision in our lives. And God guides us to see his vision succeeding does that make sense like he guides our life he gives us vision and he guides us to see this vision accomplished right and, and, and so we're going to get into this in a little bit so there's really two things i want to leave with you today on how does god guide us and what is vision and what does it look like from god because we have the holy spirit here guiding paul to where the Holy Spirit wants Paul to be. The crazy thing is, is that Paul said that he was preaching the word in Asia and the Holy Spirit forbid him. Which shows me that this is not Paul the Apostle's ministry. This shows me that this is God's ministry and Paul is really understanding. I can even do all the right things like we talked about Paul before, but in the wrong places and be out of the will of God. And so God here is guiding Paul and he goes north, right? All the way north. And, and, and the Holy Spirit forbid him to go any way there. So then he went all the way south. And the Holy Spirit stopped him from going south. Then he went all the way east. And the Holy Spirit stopped him from going east. And so now he sits there. And his back is to the Aegean Sea. And he has a vision of a Macedonian man that says, Hey, come over to Macedonia. This is where I want you to be at. And so Paul here is being guided, and this is why we need spiritual discernment as Christians. Because sometimes, if the Holy Spirit says no, it's not the devil. And we need discernment on realizing, Lord, is this demonic resistance in preaching your word? Or is this you guiding me to accomplish the things in me that you would will, right? This is where discernment and wisdom and words of knowledge and the prophetic come into play, right? Because we really need God to guide us on what he has for us. And so how does God guide us? Well, the primary way, if you're taking notes, write this down, is by his word. 
by his word, by his word, by his word. A lot of times it's like, God, speak to me, right? And he's like, I have, right? I have, and it's right here. And, and sometimes I heard it said once, and I love this, you know, some people say like, I've never heard the audible voice of God. And it's like, well, I have. I just open my mouth and I read this. And I hear God's heart. And I hear his words. And he gives me guidance daily on this. And, and it's so funny because God has spoken on so many things. And I say this tongue-in-cheek because I love prayer. I, I, I desire to be a man in communication with God. But listen, y'all, when I'm walking out this faith life, there are some things I don't even have to pray about because I already know God's heart on them. And it's not that I don't have to communicate to them, but I absolutely know. Like, I don't even have to say, Lord, should I do this or should I do this? And, you know, like, Lord, should I, should we pull more people? Lord, should we get like a, a water slide baptismal in here, right? So we can like begin to like, you know, and I, I just know what God's heart is. Not at all, you know. And there's things that, that God has already spoken and already decreed. I absolutely know that if I have a fault or an argument with my brother, I absolutely know, I, I shouldn't even say this, I, I shouldn't even say like, Lord, should I go, should I go make amends with my brother? I absolutely know God will call me to have a humble heart and to go to him and to communicate in a way to say, hey, is there a way that we can reconcile this relationship, right? Relationship takes two. If people are like, I don't want anything to do with you, that's not on you. What is on you is saying, Lord, I'm going to enact what you have declared. So my life can be guided simply by his word in a lot of different ways. Psalm 119, that's some homework for you guys. It says this, and just to let you know, it is the longest chapter in the whole Bible. So <laughs> that's your homework for this week. Psalm 19, it says, my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. So the wandering is an indication of if I'm walking this life out, right, I don't want to wander away from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Well, what are his statutes? They're found right here in where he has spoken, man. Psalm 19, the bottom of it, it says this. Your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. There's this now moment. Your word, God, leads my feet here on my feet, and it's a light into my path, and I can see, God, the direction in which you want me to walk in. I have sworn and confirmed, and I will keep your righteous judgments. So a simple way and an easy way to be guided by God is to just simply read his word. God guides us in other ways. God guides us by dreams. There have been multiple different ways, right? Pharaoh had these dreams, and it wasn't sitting well with his soul. His diviners and his, his, his wizards and his sorcerers couldn't interpret what these dreams were, right? And so he heard that Joseph had interpreted his butler's dream before. And, and, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you and you can understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it's not me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Meaning the answer that Pharaoh will get will have peace in your soul. So God was trying to communicate to Pharaoh that there would be seven days of seven years of plenty harvest and seven years of famine. And God used Joseph to speak that message to Pharaoh in that way. Abimelech was told in a dream by night where the Lord said, you're a dead man if you touch this woman who you've taken. What's that about, Nick? Well, he was a wicked king, and Abraham gave him his wife, Sarah, because he was scared that he would die. And so Abimelech was visited that night by God and said, if you touch this woman that you've taken, which is another man's wife, you're dead. That's a dream I don't want to have. You know, I don't want I ain't got a dream like that. You know what I mean? That's crazy. Matthew 12, 2, see, Matthew 2, 12, uh, it says this, And being divinely warned in a dream, the wise men who came to Christ, that they should not return to Herod, 
they departed for their own country another way. God speaks to people in dreams. God spoke to Joseph in a dream because Joseph was struggling with the idea that his espoused wife was actually pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And as he was struggling to reconcile that, he thought, you know, the best thing for me to do is to divorce this young girl, but I want to do it a way that's privately because I don't want to put her to open shame inside of the community. And as he was thinking about how to divorce Mary, the Holy Spirit gave him a vision and an angel came to him in a dream and said, do not do this because your wife or fiance at that point is impregnated with God himself. And so Joseph stayed that action and he began to walk forward with Mary and raise the son of God. Could you imagine? What pressure, huh? What pressure, what pressure, what pressure. So God speaks to us in dreams. Some people have nightmares as well. Some dreams are just demonic. I've heard people say, well, Nick, what do I do with demonic dreams? Just put them back in the pit of hell where they came from, right? Pay them no mind. Don't worry about them. And not every dream that you have will be a prophetic dream for you. You know, sometimes you're just riding a go-kart in the NASCAR race in Daytona. You know, sometimes you're just dreaming about that stuff, and that just is what it is, right? But sometimes, how will I know, Nick? How will I know if God is speaking to me in a dream? I'm telling you, it's undeniable in your spirit. You'll feel it. You'll sense it. You'll know it. And you ask God for the interpretation or ask people of God if they would be able to interpret what you know. Something is being spoken to me here in this place. So how does God guide us? He guides us by the word. He guides us by dreams sometimes. He guides us by people. The prophetic word, men and women of wisdom, experience, understanding, and insight. God's spirit rests in people, and in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12, we have all of these dynamics where a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge can be revealed by people who are full of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, Paul says, is edification, exhortation, and comfort. It means it edifies or grows somebody. It exhorts somebody, corrects maybe the way that they're going, and then it comforts. It brings comfort to people in its primary functionality. And so God can use men and women to help guide us in where we are going. Uh, Moses had a father-in-law named Jethro, and, and Jethro came alongside of Moses and said, Moses, you can't sit there in the seat of judgment and judge three million people's problems every single day. you got to set up a leadership structure. And it's got to be you up top and Aaron. And, but there's got to be like heads over these tribes. And there's got to be people under them and that dynamic. So people can actually, you know, come and get their, get their, get their, um, get their problems dealt with. And so Moses began to implement that because Jethro was a man of wisdom and he saw a problem and he knew the solution and he brought that into the table and I'm sure that it made Moses' life way mo better. <laughs> Last but not least, there's multiple different ways that this happens, right? By the word, by dreams, by people, in the prophetic. Um, the other one is by spiritual prompting right the holy spirit will begin to prompt the heart of an individual now i've known that for a while i've experienced this myself um and when the holy spirit prompts you it really is this weird dynamic of not weird that's a horrible way to say it but there is this dynamic of learning what is of the holy spirit and what is not right what is of the holy spirit and what is not so how do i know if i'm actually being prompted by the holy spirit well, before we go into how we know if the Holy Spirit is prompting us, I have something for you guys that I created, and hopefully this will work good, okay? This is you naturally without the Holy Spirit, right? Just without the Holy Spirit. This is how you make decisions on a daily basis. You have observational information, what you see in the natural. You have emotional information, what I feel about what I'm seeing, right? Right? And then you have this thing called a will that God gives us. We call this a free will, right? Now you have the freedom 
to choose a decision for your life in the natural. This is apart from God. You don't need God to do this. You now choose a decision that will affect your life based upon what you see and based upon what you feel. This is every single person in this world. The problem with this is that it's limited to your flesh, which means when I observe a situation, I can't see everything. I don't know everything that's going on. I am limited in my perception. Has anybody seen something and then it turns out that it wasn't what they thought it would be, right? And so when we see something in the flesh, it doesn't mean that we're always right. Does that make sense? Uh, it doesn't mean that. When we feel something in us, it doesn't mean that our, our emotions are always right. Does that make sense? And when people say this in Christianity, sometimes for me, and I'm not pointing or thinking about anybody specifically, but sometimes it's super cringy when Christians are so feeling driven. Well, I feel like this, or I felt like God was saying this, right? Because I read this word, and in Jeremiah, it's like, man, the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. Like, who can really know it? Like, there's a song, an old school song, Ariana Grande, the heart wants what it wants, and it does. And according to the Bible, it leads into wickedness. <laughs> it leads into wickedness, man. There's so many times where I, where I felt a certain way and I just invested myself into a situation and I came away from that situation and I was like, oh, that was the wrong choice, right? That was the wrong choice. So when we have this Holy Spirit prompting, what are we saying? What are we saying when the Holy Spirit is prompting our life? Well, if this is how we make decisions practically, we just add this in there. The will was the foundation of our decision making. Now his Holy Spirit is in us supporting our will. Meaning now God will begin to prompt you and say, listen, your observational information, even though you're seeing things and you're still lacking information, I'm going to prompt you to make a decision based upon what would glorify me, even if you don't have all of the information. Because some Christians can get into this place of called the paralysis of analysis, right? You can analyze something so much that you never step into it because you've overanalyzed it to death, right? And, it's, and it paralyzes us from making a decision because we can't see what the future actually holds. And, 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 and sometimes God's saying, listen, I know you can't see anything, but I'm prompting your heart, man. To step out in faith. You might not know everything, but you do know enough to take a faith step, right? When the Holy Spirit prompts our will, even with our emotional situation. Listen, most of the time we have such an emotional attachment to all the wrong things. We just have these emotional attachments. And sometimes, you know, the Bible, it, it says that we, your, your adversary, Satan, is, is like a roaring lion walking around seeking whom he may devour. And he says, because of this, right, we need to live soberly and righteously in, this, in these last days. Sobriety in that context is not saying don't be drunk. What, what the author is trying to communicate in that is sobriety just means you need to think clearly about this. And the Holy Spirit, though we're so feel like a certain way about certain circumstances, the Holy Spirit says, hey, listen, listen, listen. I'm going to begin to disconnect you from your emotions. And they're now not going to make you choose what you should do. I'm going to disconnect you from your emotions. And I'm going to fill in what you can't see observationally. And I'm going to ask you to make a decision based upon your knowledge of me prompting you. And that's what these promptings of the Holy Spirit are. They're not how we feel. I just felt like God wanted me to do this, right? I just felt like God wanted me to do that. It's like the Holy Spirit's like, man, he's in me, prompting me, man, teaching me this. So listen to this. This is crazy. This is what it says in Philippians. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, and not only in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, that you 
work out your salvation with trembling. Now here's the crazy part, verse 13 in Philippians 2. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Which means if our lives are going to be lives that are pleasing to God, God is going to work in us by himself the will to do what God said that he would do through us, right? So this is a great thing. It's not that I feel this way necessarily, but it's God working in me to allow me to come to a place to where now I'm accomplishing what he will by his power. This is a beautiful way to be led by God in relationship day in, day out, every single day day of our life. So how does the Holy Spirit guide us by his word in dreams, by people's prophetic words, by people, uh, by the Holy Spirit's prompting, and he's leading us and he's guiding us to accomplish his will. Another way that God guides us, and this is how they work together in this story, is by vision, by vision, by vision, by vision, by vision. What is vision from God? Vision is clarity of God's purpose in your life. Simple. Vision is clarity of God's purpose in your life. If you have any breath in your lungs, God has a purpose for you. He has given you gifts, and he desires that you release those gifts on the world in a way that would display his love, his courage, his power, his supremacy over darkness, demonic spirits, sickness and health, right? All of these different dynamics that we live. But God is saying, I want you to enact the gifts that I've given to you. So vision is, is clarity of God's purpose in your life. And why is vision from God important in life? Because vision and pursuit of the vision... Help us keep the main things, the main things in our life. If we continually take our eyes off what God values, then we inevitably will fill our life with lesser things. And God is saying, I want you to see clearly my values, my giftings, who I've made you to be, who you are in Christ. And I want you to focus on those things because the moment we take our eyes off of these things, it's not like we get our lives get easier. It's just that we fill our focus with things that mean less in this life than seeing God shine through us as a people. Jesus gave this parable of the, of the sower, where the sower goes out to sow and, and the, the seed landed on four different soils. One of those soils was the thorny soil, and it said that these, or the seed that sprung up, and the thorns that came, and it choked out the word. It says, these are they that hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things enter in. And they choke the word, and the word becomes unfruitful to them. These are people that have taken their eyes off what God is doing and growing, and they've allowed, essentially, through lethargy, other things to creep in and begin to choke out what God wants to produce. And so when we take our eyes off vision, we open ourselves up to just allowing things come in and take the space that God is trying to grow something in us and through us. It is a crazy, beautiful thing. Vision from God, just to let you guys know this, is not the same as your vocation. Please understand this. America will try to tell you that your identity is found in your job. That's why I was like, hey, I'm Nick. What do you do? Well, I'm a pastor. What do you do? I'm a teacher, right? What are you saying? Wait, what are you saying? You're saying that your vocation is the main identity that you're putting up to meet this person. And it shouldn't even be like that. Vision from God is not the same as vocation. And the problem is, is that 
they can work together. They can work together. You can bring God into your vocation. You can bring God in what called you to. But vocation, please listen to me. Vocation is the only way that you make money. That's it. That's not kingdom. People who aren't saved make money. Does that make sense? And, and so our identity or our vision in our life is not about how we make money, but once again, realizing what God has instilled us and bringing that about in our real lives. And yeah, I also make money like this, right? If you want to know how I make money or, or who's on my W-2s as my employer, like I'll tell you that. That's not a big deal, but that's not who I am as a person. And for men, man, this is hard because listen to me, listen to me. You can go to work day after day, week after week. You could provide shoes, housing. You could, you could provide food on the table and still not walk in the calling of God. Well, Nick, what are my callings and what are my giftings? If you don't know, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. Those are what God has given to you to say every single person in here has one of these gifts, two of these gifts, five of these gifts. And yeah, I'm going to preach the gospel. Paul, listen to me, preach the gospel all the time. But what was Paul's vocation? Paul's vocation was a tent maker. Paul, like, actually worked, and he made tents. And then he went and he preached the gospel. He went back to work, and he made tents, and he would go and he preached the gospel. So Paul's calling has nothing to do with, well, you're just the apostle. It's like, no, like, he is the apostle. You're just different than me. Well, he is in that way. Well, Paul's just more evangelical. Well, he is. Paul does evangelize, but the Bible says that we're all called to evangelize. We're all called to teach. We're all called to invite people into this relationship with God and to communicate to that. And so if, if our evangelism and if our teaching and if our callings and giftings are only limited to five people in the church, the fivefold ministry, that's not an effective system. God is saying, you guys are the people that I've gifted to love and to walk in power so that people would know that you are my son and you are my daughter and you've given a, a, an identity that's far above your vocation. Last but not least on the caution of vocation, mixing it up with vision. The reason why we can never have our identity in the money that we make is because when it's taken from us, we miss a part of us. I see this in athletics all the time. By the way, with athletes that have substantial injuries, when they are like a phenom athlete and they pride themselves in it and they've worked their whole life for it and then they have a knee injury that blows it out or something that happens to them and in one second, the entirety of what they built their life on is gone. And so if God strips away your vocation and you still have a healthy identity because you know exactly who you are in him, that's something that not everybody has. And we have that gift that we're able to build in people and encourage people and, 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 and to do so likewise. So never let your identity be built on something that can be taken away from you in a moment. In Jesus' name. So vision, right, once again, is just clarity uh, of God's purpose in your life, what we know that to be. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. Go read all of those. Those are God's giftings given to the church and the body. That's how we move the kingdom in this place, and we do that. But vision is not the same as vocation. Vision is clarity of God's purpose in your life. And last but not least, listen, if you do not have vision from God in your life, vision from God, if you do not have vision from God, you will be discouraged. Paul here, if he didn't have a vision from God to preach the gospel, something bigger than his current circumstance, vision from him is something that led him past his discouragement. Paul went north, south, east, and if he didn't have vision from God, he might have just said, well, I just give up. 
I guess God's not really working on this other missionary journey that we set out to do. We're just going to go home, back home to Jerusalem. It said, no, he sat there and then he got vision from God on what to do next. Vision led him past uh, his vision, led him past his discouragements in the setbacks that he initially thought and were perceiving. But we now know, looking in hindsight, that it was actually the Holy Spirit guiding his life. If you don't have vision in your life, you're never going to overcome the setbacks and the hardships because we need to keep our eye on the prize and we need to walk fastly after that in strength, love. I'm so glad that I absolutely knew that I was supposed to start a church in Daytona by the Holy Spirit. And if I would have known today, like standing on this pulpit, if I would have known today in the beginning of the church, right, what I would have to experience just to see Christ birth in this place, I would have never left Oregon ever, ever in my life. God was like, go to Daytona. I'm like, yeah, Lord, you're going to use me to do a mega church, right? And, and it's going to be like, it's going to be like a million people with shallow relationships, but really awesome music, right? And, and, and I got over here, man, and it just wasn't like I thought, but I knew, regardless of what I made in my mind, I knew I was called to do this. And over time, he gave me something that was so much better than a mega church. He gave me real church, which is you guys. He gave me real people that actually care about the gospel and want to go deeper in the message of Christ. And I would have never thought, man, that that would have a greater value in my life than, than 7,000 people who have loose affiliations to Jesus. And so, and so what I've received now is, is so much greater and, and, and grand. But I knew in my heart, man, I know I'm called to do this. And because I knew I was called, I was also equipped. I was also empowered. It allowed me to go over things that I would normally be discouraged by in Jesus' name. I'm going to have the worship team come on back up here. And I want to finish out with one simple thing. When God gives you vision, calling, and purpose, I want to share with you, initially, it will look like something in your mind, but I want you to be open to what God ultimately will do. Because when God gives you a vision, initially Paul saw in his mind a Macedonian man saying, come over here, come over here, come over here. And that's what Paul saw. That's what the vision that he had. And then he went over to Macedonia and he found himself in a place called Philippi, which we would get the letter to the Philippians later on. And you know what he found? He found a bunch of women praying by a river. Paul was given a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come on over. And all the boys, they said, hey, it sounds good. Let's cross the Aegean Sea. And they got over there and they just found a bunch of women. Now, Paul here is somebody who's incredibly proper. And so I promise you, if the Lord, I, I, this is just me thinking about this. So I can't even say I promise you, so I'll take that back. But from me reading Paul's letter, if he got a vision about women over in Macedonia being like, come over here, Paul. Come over here, Paul. He would have probably been like, nah, that's not the Lord, right? That's not the Lord. But he had a Macedonian man say, come over here. So when God sometimes gives you vision, when you get there, listen to me, oftentimes it will be different than what you thought it would be, but it will be greater than you ever imagined. Oftentimes, it looks different than what you thought, but it will be greater than you could have ever imagined. Lydia and this woman who loved purple opened up her house, and her house, as we will begin to see, became the central location for the gospel to come in to Europe and to come all the way over eventually to America. And for people like me, to hear and understand who Jesus is. And it's interesting because I think about it and I wonder if eternally the Holy Spirit knew that the effects of the preaching of the word here, though some might be saved, that might be fine. But Paul, I don't want you to go there. I want, 
Then Paul says, well, I'm going to go here. And the Holy Spirit's like, no, I want you to have a great effect in this world. Okay, I want you to go here. Nope, that's not where I'm calling you to do. Well, where do I go, Lord? Come over here, a Macedonian man. And you go over there, and it's a bunch of women. They don't understand it. But their hearts were open to hear what the Word said. And this woman became the central place where the apostles would go after they were beaten and imprisoned. They would go to the house of Lydia, and they were fed, and they were healed in her house. And they would go out, and they would get beaten again. And they would come back, and they would be fed, and they would be healed. And they would go out, and they would die. And some would come back, and they would be healed, and they would be fed, and they would go out again. If we know that Lydia's house was the place where the gospel launched all of Euro-Asia, all of Europe in and of itself, then we as a people can begin to rejoice when God tells us no on certain things. Meaning, for Paul, what I love about this is that God was like, I don't want you to spend one second in a place that will be less effective than the place where I want you to come to. And so Paul heard a no, heard a no, heard a no. He wasn't discouraged. He knew that he was walking in his calling. He just had to receive vision from God to overcome discouragement and get direction and clarity from what God wanted to do. And when he took that time to do it, man, the entire effect of the gospel and the house of Lydia is a beautiful thing. So we can rejoice as Christians that God will say yes and that God will say no to us like any good father. Says yes to the right things, says no to the wrong things, and we can rejoice that even though we might not understand, even like Paul, man, I walked 65 miles up here. Like I walked 65 miles, and you're telling me no, but I put all of this effort in, I put all of this stuff. Paul, I don't want you there, man. Well, I'm gonna go, I don't want you there either. Well, I'm gonna go, I don't want you there. So Paul comes to a place, where do I go? What do I do? receives vision, simply obeys, finds the people there, not who are the greatest theological believers, but just these simple women who had finances, they had vision, they were entrepreneurs in spirit, and they said, please come to our house and stay. And I think that that's what God is just asked, looking for in these days, people with simple vision who simply respond when God simply prompts their heart by the Holy Spirit to step into a situation that's unknown to them, but trusting that God is leading them and guiding them and that eventually they will see the fruits of what God is calling them to do. And that's what we're doing here in this church and in this place. I love this church. I love this church so much, but I know that this isn't it for us as a church. You're part of a growing church. We've had record numbers of people coming in here that we've ever had before in our seven-year existence. And it's not because, like, we have, like, the best programs or anything. It's just I honestly believe that people are really looking for a real church to fellowship with, real people who really love God and recognize that we're all flawed in certain ways and we're helping each other ease each other's burden as we walk through this life. And we're encouraging people to do that continually. And so God is not done with this place. You know, this church here in Daytona looks very different than what I considered in my mind when I was a 25-year-old man. But like I said, it's far greater now than I ever thought it would be. And I'm excited to see where it's going. And I'm excited to continue to worship with you guys. So, Father, we thank you for Paul. What an example, Lord, of a person who went through so much so we could learn so much. God, save us from our own ideology. Save us from our own false expectations of what you should do. God, even if we put the time in it and spent the resources as Paul did to travel this way or that way, seeking something, Lord, seeking some sort of open door, but all he found were closed doors. God, may it be well with our soul. 
knowing that we don't need to abandon our calling. We just need to redirect by the Holy Spirit. Focus our calling. Be led by you. Have our will and our hearts prompted by you so we can make decisions. And we don't have to waste this life investing ourselves into things year after year that just do not matter. So Holy Spirit, continue to work. Continue to overfill us with your guidance, your prophetic words, your words of wisdom, your words of knowledge as we seek to move forward in this city. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, church, we're going to be taking communion, so the communion tables are going to be open, and we'll be taking communion together as a church.